Simply put, I hated it. <laughs> Listen, I don't want to say it's a glee curse, but probably a glee curse. But let's be honest, glee did not cause that man to die in a car fire. Yeah, I mean, I've read Naya's book three times, so I may as well have been sat there in a Cheerio costume next to her on the set. Hi, pals. So I'm back, I think. I've taken a little bit of a break, but yeah, hopefully I'm back. I've just had a kind of busy few months um, with some big life changes that I've taken some kind of getting used to. But I still want to make videos and I still hope that you want to hear what I have to say. But I am still here. Thank you for sticking around if you have done. So I'm sure that you've heard about the new three-part documentary about Glee called The Price of Glee. And to say it's not been well received is a bit of an understatement. I mean, when it was first announced, people were so excited. Like a three-part documentary about the show that was crazy and wild, exciting and interesting and meant so much to so many of us. But then as soon as the first trailer dropped, it was very clear that this was not going to be a good documentary and this was not going to be the documentary that we all wanted. Various cast members spoke out about the documentary and said, you know, being part of the Glee bubble and what it was like, nobody else understood that and this documentary is not representative of that. There were none of the lead cast involved in the documentary and it's something that they only really understood and they also said that like they feel protective of each other of what they went through on the show. Like, yes, it was amazing, but yes, there were also very difficult times it's very clear that that was a fact but like it's not right to be reopening the wounds of like losing co-workers and the stress of the working hours and the emotional and physical reactions they will have had to being on the show and then to like make some sensationalized documentary about it lots of people have spoken about having like a morbid curiosity with the documentary but not really wanting to watch it so that's why i thought i would do this video i thought i'll volunteer myself as tribute i would get a free trial for Discovery Plus and for those of you who don't want to watch it but still kind of want to know what's involved, what was said, then that's why I'm here. I did actually download Discovery Plus back in lockdown because I think they make very dramatic and like enticing trailers. So you're like, oh, this looks amazing. I'll have to watch this. Look at all the juicy gossip. And then you watch it and it's m so much more style over substance. Like their documentaries are just objectively rubbish. I watched three documentaries on the site during lockdown and my God, they were so bland. It was like they came from the Shane Dawson school of documentary making. Somebody will be saying something completely innocuous and there'll be like this crazy dramatic music underneath and some stock footage of something creepy and eerie and, and I feel like they think that that is what makes a true crime documentary rather than the actual content. So this one is called The Price of Glee and the fact that it could be found in the crime section of the Discovery Plus app should have been like our first major red flag. The whole vibe was making the experience of Glee into like true crime. Like it's not the same thing. The documentary as well very heavily plays into the fact that three of the original cast members have died since their time on the show and then blamed them all on Glee, which is just ridiculous. The first episode opens with a comment from Ryan Murphy that he did in Entertainment Weekly where he said that what started off as being such a great celebration of love and acceptance ultimately became about darkness and death. And I tell you, I bet the documentary makers were in seventh heaven when they found that quote because it just sums up what they clearly wanted this documentary to be. I read the article that this was from. It was in 2016 that this came out, which was like kind of around the end of Glee. And it's very clear that this is someone who is very emotionally drained from the process and was maybe in a bit of a bad place. And I don't think it was an accurate representation of the show or of how Ryan Murphy feels about it. He recently did two episodes on Jenna and Kevin's podcast where he talked for a few hours about his experience on Glee. It's very clear that he didn't see it as something that came down to being about darkness and death. That was something he said like seven years ago and it also starts with this kind of like dirgy music and it says like however many young actors in 2009 made their TV debuts by 2022 they all would be famous and three would be dead. It's just gross. 
it's just making these three people's deaths into drama when it's still so raw. Naya died less than three years ago and it's just no. So the first episode opens with like the journey of Glee starting and the casting process and things. For me the most interesting thing I thought was obviously we've all seen the clips of Leah Michelle doing her original Rachel Berry audition where she's like telling Brad the piano guy off for doing something wrong in her song and she's like bossing people about. But the most interesting fact for me was just thinking wow Leah Michelle really woke up that day and said for this audition to be the lead in a new TV show I'm gonna wear a vest top with a bulldog on it wearing a crown. <laughs> like what was she thinking? <laughs> the 2008 was really screaming in that clip. There were some interesting behind the scenes clips and pictures and things that I hadn't seen before but they recycled them so many times that by the end of the three episodes they didn't even feel like exclusive clips anymore. They felt like something I'd seen a million times. They clearly didn't have enough content to fill three episodes but they just they just kept on going. So we can't really talk about the documentary without talking about the people who they got in to talk about the show. There was a director of photography, a set designer, an art director, some stand-ins, a dancer from season one and two, a couple of Corey's friends and Naya's dad was in it as well. And then also some entertainment reporters. One who was literally just in college at the time and was like, yeah, I was a Gleek. So you weren't even working in the industry at the time. It's not like you had any like inside information. There was another girl who was an entertainment reporter who was literally just citing things that Naya had said in her book. She kept being like, yeah, well Naya said this in her book and Naya said this in her book. I read her book. I could have bloody well been picked up to be in it. I can see it now. It would say at the bottom, Amy Lovett, Gleek, loser, irregular YouTube uploader. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've read Naya's book three times, so I may as well have been sat there in a Cheerio costume next to her on the set. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> the whole thing is just cringe as well like they're trying so hard to give it the true crime treatment and you've got people going oh it was amazing it was the best time of my life and at the same time you've got like stock footage of like a man stood on an empty stage or like a camera going down a corridor slowly and like some creepy underscorey music to make it eerie it's like what are you even doing it's embarrassing i would actually love a real glee documentary like i think there is so much there where it could be really interesting but I just don't think it will ever happen to be honest. I think there's been too much online discourse about the show. I do think there has been too much loss and I think as well like what Becca Tobin said who played Kitty on the show. She said like they're protective of each other of what they went through on the show and I think unless a documentary was made and produced by people who were in the cast or like Ryan with heavy input from the cast I just don't think it would ever be made or like the documentary that we would want would ever be made. Honestly some of the editing in this thing as well is just so embarrassing. The editing is just bad. They do talk about the insane working conditions on the show and that's for everybody but specifically for the performers you know they said that they'll spend six hours in a dance class then six hours in singing lesson and then in between that they're also learning the lines and then they go on set to film for hours. You know they talked about 16 hour work days and 70 hour work weeks which is just insane and I do think that that could be a really interesting topic to cover in a documentary documentary. You know, the way that people are overworked to a point of exhaustion in the entertainment industry. And they can talk about the need for pastoral care for those people as well. Maybe with a focus on those who have a history with substance abuse like Corey. You know, I mean, really there should have been a plan in place when Corey disclosed his past. There should have definitely been a plan in place and that is on the producers for not putting some kind of pastoral care there for him to protect him from the pressures of fame and all the stuff that comes with being in a TV show. Especially when you have got such a heavy history with that and like specifically at a time when you know Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram and YouTube were really becoming massively popular at the same time that Glee was and people were actually able to access the information about the people that they saw on TV in a way that they never had been before. You know fame has always been an intense thing with paparazzi and people wanting to know details of your personal life but before the internet that wasn't kind of as accessible but Glee at this time where so social media blew up and then also the Glee cast weren't just on a TV show they were on international tours they were on the Billboard Top 100 they were in the charts it created this perfect storm for the people who were involved and who were in the cast to be overwhelmed and to feel on edge and unsafe and stressed and I'm sure it's bigger than any of them could have imagined. Maybe a documentary on that, maybe that would be interesting. Not sensationalizing it, just talking about what happened. 
Something I didn't like as well was Corey's roommate. He said like, oh, you know, Corey really didn't like to talk about the bad things that happened in his life and the things he was struggling with. But here I am gonna talk about it for three hours. Like, do you not think it's like exploitative of your friend, of your dead friend to say, oh yeah, he really didn't like talking about his private life. But here I am gonna talk about his private life. And you go in and sharing that with an audience. Like, I just don't like that. They did talk about Corey's struggles while he was on the show with like the price of fame and stalkers and then also his comparisons that he made with himself to the other cast members and like not feeling good enough and stuff and I do think that Corey's involvement in the show could have had something to do with his relapse and then obviously with his death but we also know that a lot of people who struggle with substance abuse when they get clean they don't always stay clean from the first time and a lot of people do relapse and so just because he was sober when he came to LA doesn't mean he would have necessarily stayed that way if he'd stayed in Canada. Obviously we would hope that but it's not a guarantee and it is possible that he relapsed because of his time on Glee but it isn't a fact and I don't think we should pretend it was. Ugh. The next part of the documentary was actually gross when they got a celebrity researcher who specialised in the final days of celebrities before they died. So they took him up to Canada and he's like walking around the streets outside of the hotel of where Corey died. And he pulls up this photo of Corey with some girl and a guy on the street and the girl is holding two cans of beer. And he's like, what we know from this photo is it is implied that Corey did consume two to three beers in the days before he died. Like, I'm sorry, is this a joke? I, I just can't even. So when they tied up the section on Corey's death, the show kind of turned its focus to Leah Michelle and implying that Corey's relapse was something to do with her and her fault and how she didn't really care about him. She was only with him because he was on a TV show, which I just think is objectively unfair to say. Like, she was on the TV show too. It's not like she needed clout from this guy. She's ended up marrying some guy who's not an actor, not on a TV show, and she seems to be pretty happy with him. They also talked about Leah's attitude on set and kind of linked Corey's death to that as well. I mean, listen, I think Leah Michelle has definitely got her problems. She very clearly wants to be in the spotlight. She was probably awful to work with. I am in no doubt of that. But I do think that she loved Corey. You know, talking about Corey being upset about his dancing skills and stuff that, I mean, they even wrote his inability to dance into the show but in Naya's book she said like a season break once like Leah went off with Corey and he came back and he was a better dancer and he was stronger and Leah had been helping him and it's like she wouldn't do that if she didn't care and also Naya did not like Leah but she still even said that in the book that she very clearly cared for him. I don't think you can act the pain that she was clearly going through after he died and I don't think it's fair to link the two things at all. At one point they also talked about how after Corey died Ryan Murphy basically put the decision on what to do with season five on Leah Michelle. The show took a one week delay in airing season five and included a tribute episode to Corey. Lots of people said like it's too soon to be coming back to the show but Leah said you know I want to be working. Leah Michelle has been working as an actor since she was eight years old. This is what she knows and Leah said like I want to be working. I want to come back. This is where I can be focused. Ryan Murphy at the time was more than double Leah Michelle's age and recently on Jenna and Kevin's podcast he said like he didn't make the right decisions. It probably was too soon to come back. He regrets his choices. So I don't think it's fair as well to say that coming back too soon was Leah Michelle's fault. She didn't know what she was doing. Like, she was a young 20 odd year old girl. She just lost her boyfriend and her colleague. She was planning his funeral to help out his mum so that she wouldn't have to do it. She will have been worried about everyone's careers. She will know that you take a hiatus from work on a TV show, that is hundreds of people's jobs, that is thousands of dollars of money. And also, Leah had been in work since she was eight years old on, on Broadway as a performer and stuff. So like, work is a constant for her. So like maybe I get it. I probably wouldn't have wanted to but like everybody grieves differently. It's like in normal life. Sometimes you know people in your workplace a family member will die. Some people don't miss a day of work. Some people miss years of work. Like everybody's different. And it was a massive decision to put on Leah and it can't have been easy. A girl who played Naya's stand-in on the show as well was like yeah everyone was forced back to work because of Leah. But Kevin literally said on his podcast 
that they were given the decision as to whether they wanted to return for the, specifically for the tribute episode or not. Like Diana wasn't in the episode, so it's clear that she declined that offer. So it's like, why are we listening to somebody who was not directly involved in the discussions and the, the emotions of being in that lead cast and making those decisions over like listening to just Jenna and Kevin's podcast? So talking about the working hours of the show and things, a guy who was a gaffer for five seasons told a story about how he had a brother who he encouraged to move to LA to come and work as one of the best boys on the set of Glee and he said that then the pressure the politics of the entertainment industry and the stress meant that he died by suicide at the start of season six and his brother says I blame that on Glee in this documentary we don't even find out the man's name the fact that they will infantilize Corey's death and they'll blame Leah Michelle for it and speculate on what he did the days and hours before he died. And yet they'll just completely brush over another person who worked on the show who died. And their family member even blames the show for their death. And they won't talk about that. Like they also talked very quickly about some other people who died on the show, like Jim Fuller, who worked with the background actors, um, died at 41 of a heart attack. Also mentioned a PA called Nancy, who also died by suicide. And then they'll have somebody saying like, yeah, it's not to do with the show, but you know, at the same time, there is a pattern and it is probably the Glee curse. They also talked a man called Paul, who was a member of the props team who also died from a heart attack when he was out on a run one day. And another Mark Watson, who was Matthew Morrison stand in, who died in a car fire. And they're really playing into this whole, it's a Glee curse thing. It's just so gross. The entire segment of the deaths of these five other people who worked on the show, it's saved for like less than 10 minutes at the end of an episode, which again, I just think is gross. Like they worked on the show as much as the other people, like just because they weren't famous doesn't mean that they should be just shoved in the back of an episode. I mean, looking at those five deaths, it is certainly possible that some of working in the entertainment industry might have had some kind of effect on them. But let's be honest, Glee did not cause that man to die in a car fire. And it is disrespectful to imply that it did. Oh my god. There was then a clip of Mark looking into camera and saying, on the show I'm a bad guy, but in real life I'm the worst guy, which I actually thought was gross. I hadn't seen that clip before and it made me feel sick. So we find out in the third episode that Mark's girlfriend at the time was actually the one who found the indecent images on his computer and notified the police. What a queen. Thank you for your services. I don't know, they were also really trying to blame the fact that Mark Salling was a paedophile and killed himself on him being in Glee. They're saying like, oh, well, he was a sexual deviant, so what do you expect? When you add fame into that, what do you expect? What? I'm sorry, what? Do you even hear yourselves? Something I did admittedly find interesting in the show was there were some clips of Naya as a child when she was on Royal Family, which she talked about in the book. Obviously I have read her book and when I did read it, I tried to find the clips and I hadn't been able to. So it was interesting to like see those that I hadn't seen before, but like, that's about the beginning and end of what was actually interesting in this documentary. I did find it somewhat interesting to bring up the apparent lack of opportunities for the cast after they left Glee. You know, some have gone on to have somewhat successful careers, but in comparison to the popularity of Glee, they really haven't. So like Naya's dad was saying, you know, when you're on Glee, everyone's like, you're amazing. You're gonna be the next Beyonce. You're gonna be the next whoever. And then the show ended and like, for a lot of them, those calls didn't come and people weren't that interested in casting them. I mean, most of the cast are still working, but it's mainly a lot of like reality TV shows. Obviously Leah's in Funny Girl, but before then she hadn't done like a regular show or TV show in ages. Obviously Darren has won awards and everything for being in Versace and Hollywood and stuff. And a few of them have had albums out. Chris Colf is obviously like a best-selling New York Times author. But it did make me think about the show and like growing up on a show like Glee because in the show they kind of aged out of their roles and in the show they kind of became has-beens in their own show like they were constantly bringing in new characters and new storylines and then you'd have like Rachel and Kurt in New York trying to get by and like I don't know it just maybe the industry also saw them that way like too old to play teenagers anymore but like kind of just like has-beens I don't know I have to say I felt quite uncomfortable watching this section with my 
Maya's dad. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, he's her dad and it's his prerogative to talk about his child in the way that he wants and where he wants and everything. But taking him up to the place where she died, it just made for like really uncomfortable viewing. And I felt like, is this exploiting him as well? The price of Glee. Naya dying was not the price of Glee. It was a tragic accident. It had nothing to do with Glee. There was then another disgusting section where they took an entertainment reporter and a coroner out on a boat on the lake that Naya Rivera died on, trying to find out like exactly what happened. Naya's dad had literally just said that the investigative team and everything didn't necessarily have a definitive answer about why she actually died and wasn't able to get herself back up on the boat after saving her son. But then you've got some entertainment reporter and a random coroner with a printout of a toxicology report, like, let's go and find out. And it was just disgusting. And then you've got these people saying like, oh, you know, this is the third, third member of a cast to die in an odd way. What made her go out on the boat with her son that day? Like, it was summer. That's what people do in the summer. They go out on boats, on lakes. What do you mean? It's like they're trying to make something dramatic out of every single minute detail of everything. And there's a reporter saying like, oh, you know, on Twitter in the days following, people were analyzing the CCTV footage of her walking across a car park and it was ridiculous. But here I am going to now analyze the way she walked across this car park. Like, are, are you, are you having a laugh? They're saying like, oh, did she go out on the lake because it was the only place where she could escape her career in Glee and her divorce from Ryan Dorsey. What, her career in Glee that happened multiple years ago and her divorce from Ryan Dorsey that happened three years earlier? And I just don't think it's fair to link Naya and Corey and Mark together in this way. They all had totally different deaths and all the people they're interviewing are going, listen, I don't wanna say it's a Glee curse, but probably a Glee curse. To be honest, I ended up getting pretty angry by the end of the last episode. This whole Glee curse thing is just gross. They also brought up Melissa and Blake's relationship and like his domestic abuse. Like, I'm sorry, anybody who saw season two of the Glee project and saw Blake Jenner on there could tell that he has always had an anger problem and is just not a nice guy. Someone on the, someone in the documentary as well said that they had overheard someone else talking to a cast member, talking about the Glee curse and they were like, oh, and the cast member was really upset about it. Like, obviously they're upset about it. Imagine your friends and colleagues die and then people are like, oh, just gotta be the glee curse though. And then as soon as something bad happens in your life, you're thinking, I don't want this to go into the news because people will just keep saying, oh, it's the glee curse. It's trivializing people's real emotions and real tragedy and trauma. At the end of the day, hundreds of people worked on glee over the years and there are some tragic deaths and some tragic things that happen, but really like, Life happened. It just so happened to also be in the news with famous people. You know, Corey could have relapsed in Canada and died there before he became famous or after. If Corey hadn't gone on Glee, he could have very well still awfully relapsed and died in Canada. Mark didn't become a paedophile because of Glee. That is most likely also inevitable. And Naya, she could have gone on a boat with her son, gone for a swim, and got stuck, saved her son and not been able to get back up. Those things could have all happened without Glee. The whole documentary was just a mess though. Like in one breath, they're saying, oh, it's a curse. This is true crime. This all happened because of Glee and Leah Michelle. And then in the next breath, they're like, oh, well, life just happens, doesn't it? Like pick a side. Then they spend about two minutes at the end being like, yeah, but Glee was amazing though, wasn't it? Like best time of my life. Like you just spent three hours saying that because of this show, a man basically became a sex offender and killed himself. Simply put, I hated it. I hope in me making this video, it maybe means that even one person will decide not to tune in and not to watch this shit show of a documentary. The idea of me making this video is to share what's included so you don't have to watch it. I think we need to watch and listen to the people who were actually involved, listen to Jenna and Kevin's podcast, support the cast and their other projects, but don't watch this documentary for your own sake. It's just complete and utter bullshit. It was just badly made. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I I hope you enjoyed this video. If you stuck around, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I will hopefully see you again soon. Love you lots. Bye.